You are listening to Harmony Sermons at Harmony Church in Sumter, South Carolina. We exist to see God's people become devoted, connected, and reaching. And we love the fact you decided to join in on listening to this sermon today. But we also realize that there is no substitute in connecting with others. If you have any questions about visiting church, or if we can connect you to a local church wherever you are, please visit us at HarmonyChurchSumter.com. Cheers, and let's begin. Uh, no, <clears throat> I did not lose a bet. Just, just <laughs> tried something different this week. Uh, hey, if you got a Bible this morning, we're going to be in James chapter three. James chapter three. And as you're turning there, let me uh, just share a couple of cool things with you that happened this past week. This past Tuesday and Wednesday, we had a small army of volunteers that uh, prepared and then served lunch at both campuses at uh, the Liberty Charter School. And uh, man, just awesome, served about 100 people, a lot of work went into this, and I'm just super grateful and thankful for uh, the, the folks that uh, they came and cooked the food and then served the food. It was really, really a, a good thing. You know, part of our, our vision here is we want to be devoted to God, connected to others, and reaching the world, and that also means our own little world here in Sumter. And so any opportunity we have to just tangibly show the love of Jesus in a practical way like that is a really important thing. So super thankful for those of you that helped out, prayed for that. Really uh, especially thankful for Cindy Robertson and Gail Singleton. They kind of spearheaded the whole project and they spent a lot of hours here this week and uh, very, very thankful for them. Uh, yeah, we can give them a hand. Now that's, that's a cool thing, but the next uh, news is even better. You know, we believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is uh, powerful enough and understandable enough, simple enough, that even a child can come to understand it. And this past week, we had two uh, kids here at Harmony that placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And super thankful for that. So we got the, where's the McCoys at? Right over here. I'm putting them on the spot, man. Adeline and, and Jace trusted in Jesus and uh, made him their savior this week and super proud of them. This is why we do kids ministry. This is why we invest in family ministries. This is why we equip parents to be able to know how to share the gospel with their kids. So just really, really grateful and thankful for uh, what the Lord is doing here in a whole bunch of different areas. Well, I was thinking the other day about uh, some things that I remembered hearing as a kid that I took as the absolute gospel truth that now I know just aren't remotely true at all. You tell me if you remember hearing any of these things. When I was a kid in the summertime, if, if I was swimming in a lake or a pond or a pool and I took a, a break to eat lunch... What was I not supposed to do immediately after eating? Can't get back in that water, right? Because you'll get a cramp and you'll drown. Well, it turns out that's not true. Like, th there's no evidence to prove that. I mean, you might get a cramp, but that wouldn't have anything to do with you eating and then swimming. Uh, how about this? When, when I was, again, when I was a kid, I would go to my grandparents' house after school, and I'd watch television. I'd sit on the floor in front of the TV, and I bet you know what my grandma warned me against. Don't sit too close to the television or else you'll ruin your eyesight. Now, I imagine if you sat like, you know, an inch from the TV, that might kind of mess up your eyes. But turns out sitting close to the television, that's not going to ruin your eyesight. How about this? Don't go outside in cold weather without really bundling up or else you'll catch a cold. Uh, definitely don't go outside in the wintertime when your hair is wet. That's like an instant cold. Well, uh, no, you don't catch a cold from being in cold weather. You catch a cold from a virus. I used to think that if I ate a lot of carrots that I'd never have to wear glasses or contacts because my <laughs> eyesight would be like Superman's eyesight. Turns out that's not true at all. How about this? Um, did anybody ever tell you when you were younger, don't crack your knuckles because if you crack your knuckles when you're young, when you're old, you'll have arthritis. Yeah, not true. The point is sometimes we tend to believe myths or, or folk wisdom that really isn't true at all. Now, sometimes we believe things that aren't true, and it's not really that big of a deal. You know, me missing out on some extra swimming time when I was a kid, that didn't negatively affect my life. But there are things that we believe and hold to that are very harmful, that, that can mess up your life and change the trajectory of your life. How about this one? If you aren't happy in your marriage, just leave, just end your marriage, go find somebody else, because then you'll be happy. Or, or how about this? Yeah, you can't really afford that new truck. You can't really afford that vacation. But imagine how happy you'll be if you have those things. So go ahead and just make the purchase. I mean, people buy into myths like this every single day. And it is having a devastating effect on people's lives. 
We've been talking about real life practical issues like this in the series that we've been in through the New Testament letter of James. We're eight weeks into the series that we're calling Face the Mirror. The author of this letter is a man named James, and he is writing to a group of Jewish believers in Jesus to just instruct them about uh, what the Christian faith is all about, how to live out real life practical Christianity. I mentioned a few weeks ago that James was Jewish, and oftentimes Jewish biblical writers would <clears throat> would write in a circular pattern. <clears throat> so they'd address a, a topic, and then they'd uh, move on to a different topic, and then they'd come back to that first topic. And in this letter, James has already addressed with us the, the topic of wisdom. And he's told us that if you're lacking in wisdom, all you need to do is ask God for wisdom, and God will give it to you. Well, he's going to again address this topic of wisdom with us today. Notice how he starts off here, chapter 3, verse 13. He says, Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. So James says, hey, who, who in your church, who in your faith community thinks they really have their act together when it comes to wisdom? Don't just tell me that you're wise. Show me that you have a lot of wisdom. Because a common tendency people have is to equate wisdom and understanding with cleverness or, or being smart. And James cautions us against that. He says, show me that you're wise by how you live and how you act. Wisdom is something that has to be shown, and it doesn't exist if it isn't shown. So wisdom is not primarily seen in, in our words, but in our actions. And James is going to tell us here that in life, there's two sources of, of wisdom. There's a good, helpful source of wisdom, and then there's another kind of wisdom that isn't really wisdom at all <clears throat> that will lead you astray and harm you. So I want to look this morning at two pictures of wisdom. And the first picture of wisdom, the first kind of wisdom, is what we'll call worldly wisdom. Notice how James describes it. Verse 14, he says, But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. He goes on in verse 15, Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Now, what James does here is he gives us three descriptions of, of this kind of worldly wisdom. The kind of pattern of living and being that most people in the world follow. And the first description that he gives us is pretty intense. He says that it's satanic. Did you see that? Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Now for something to be demonic or satanic, it doesn't mean that it has to look like something out of the exorcist. If something is demonic or satanic, it means that it is devoid of good and it's devoid of God. And how much of today's wisdom and advice would fall into that category? You know, at the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, we have the, the story of Adam and Eve. And you remember what happened, right? A, uh, the, the serpent tempted Eve to trust in his wisdom instead of God's wisdom. And man, the enemy has been doing the exact same thing in every one of our lives today. And so an example of uh, demonic, satanic, worldly wisdom would be this. Follow your heart. Do what makes you happy. I mean, that is the mantra of 2024. And it sounds great, and it sounds really inspirational, until you realize that the Bible says that our heart is actually desperately wicked. That, that's the wording that the Scripture uses. We can't trust our hearts because our hearts would lead us astray. And shocker of all shockers, my happiness, your happiness, that is actually not the most important thing. But if I let that guide my decision-making and how I live my life, that's going to lead me down a path toward destruction because it is satanic. You're probably aware that there's an actual satanic church. They, they meet together. They have a, a, a Bible. It's a satanic Bible. Anybody know the name of the man that wrote the satanic Bible? Anton LaVey. And do you know what the, the mantra of the satanic church is? Do you know what the, their vision statement is? So again, ours is devoted to God, connected to others, reaching the world. The, the, the vision statement, the, the statement that guides the satanic church is this. Do as you will. Do what you want to do. If it feels good, man, just, just go for it. Do what makes you happy. Follow your heart. That's why James says that worldly wisdom is satanic. It's satanic because following your heart prioritizes your desires above everything else. You know, my heart has consistently desired things and wanted things that would lead me astray. And if I follow my heart, I would make a train wreck of my life. 
And see, this is what our enemy wants. He wants us to follow this satanic worldly wisdom that would lead us away from God and lead us away from godly wisdom. Don't discount the enemy's role in leading you astray. I mean, if God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, guess what Satan wants? He hates you. He has a terrible plan for your life. So maybe an example of, of worldly wisdom would be this. You get a job offer that will pay you a little bit more money than you're making now, but it would require you to work every single Sunday. I mean, it would really take you away from your involvement in the life of the church. Or, or students, maybe you get a scholarship to a college, and it's a, it's a pretty big scholarship. But if you're honest, in your heart of hearts, you're not sure that, that you're spiritually mature enough to be that far away from home in a totally unchristian setting like that. See, satanic wisdom might not have anything to do with pentagrams or, or Ouija boards, but this is the kind of wisdom that wants you to make choices and decisions where you don't consider God at all. Be very careful about wisdom that would seek to take you away from God or disregard God. James goes on, he gives us another characteristic of worldly wisdom. He says, first of all, it's satanic, and so it would make sense that it's also selfish. Look, look at that in verse 16. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. The wisdom of the world measures everything by how it affects you. So it's concerned with how you can advance yourself and how you can promote yourself and how you can assert yourself. This is the type of wisdom that looks at every situation in life and, and it says, what, what can I get out of this? James uses this phrase, selfish ambition. Isn't selfish ambition the root of marriage problems? You're not doing this for me, and I'm not getting this, and this isn't happening. This kind of selfish person lives in their own little universe, and they become jealous of anybody that threatens it. I think it's really weird that James uses this in, in verse 14. He says, but if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast. Who's boasting about being envious, right? Like that's that's embarrassing. I don't want you to know that I envy you. Well, think about this. How much of our nice stuff that we have and we love to show off, how much of that did we buy because we wanted uh, to impress others? We saw that other people had it and we envied it. So I bought that truck because I saw that you had it. And we upgraded to a bigger house that we didn't really need and we can't really afford because you had a house like that. And I was fine with my Walmart water bottle until I saw you and your Stanley Cup. Right now, i got to have one of those. We envy people. We have selfish ambition. And so we make foolish, unwise, worldly decisions because we are selfish. I mean, we just have a great big preoccupation with us. A couple of weeks ago, Jeff Knauer sent me a, a picture of this thing that he saw. It's called I Am Enough. We have a, a picture of it here. So you can buy this on Amazon. These are daily affirmation cards. And so the point is, you get up in the morning and you read a card for the day, and it's supposed to center you and prepare you for the day. And the whole point of these cards is to remind you, you are enough. Like, if, if life is a movie, you play the starring role. There's other supporting actors in this movie called Life, but they're there to shine the spotlight on you. And so here's some of the daily affirmations that you can read every morning to get yourself ready for the day. I will not go softly through life. I matter. My dreams, goals, and aspirations matter. I'm doing this life for me. Whenever I say no to other people, I'm saying yes to myself. I am strong. I am unstoppable. I am more powerful than I know, and I am beautiful just as I am. Now, not all that is horrible. And I'm not saying that we need to beat ourselves up. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be kind to ourselves. But what a self-centered approach to life. And if this is the kind of selfish wisdom, worldly wisdom that you are following and buying into, it's going to lead you down a road to destruction. So worldly wisdom is satanic. It's selfish. And then thirdly, it's, it's soiled. In verse 16, James says, For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. That word disorder means complete chaos and, and, and confusion. What it means is making decisions that are influenced by, by the enemy, by Satan, where I'm only thinking about myself selfishly, leads to soiled wisdom that does not work. A couple months ago, we, we did a, a little painting project at our house, and I am like the world's messiest painter. I mean, I get it all over me. 
And so when we were done with our project, I had completely soiled and ruined the, the pair of uh, shorts and shirt that I was wearing. So what did I do? Well, I took that pair of shorts and shirt out of regular rotation. I, I can't wear them anymore because they're, they're soiled. They're not going to work for me anymore. And some of you have, have tapped into the wisdom of the world so deeply that you have found out the hard way it does not work. Satanic, selfish wisdom doesn't work in the long run. It leads you to destruction and chaos and ruin. Now remember, James is writing to Christians here. This kind of stuff happens in Christian churches. And some of you have done relationships this way. You've done friendships and romantic relationships this way. And you've found out that it's, it's soiled. It doesn't work. I don't know if you saw this story a few weeks ago, but off the coast of Japan, there was a, a pod of killer whales they got stuck in a section of really thick ice. Did anybody see this? They, they couldn't get out. There was no way that, that humans could get there to, to free them. So there was about six or seven of these whales. They were in this uh, little small area, maybe 50 or 60 feet of, of water in the ice, and they were trapped. They didn't have any room to swim. They just kind of bobbed up and down. They'd stick their head out of the water to breathe. Eventually, they freed themselves, but for a few days, we, we thought it was going to be certain death for them because there was no way they could be rescued. They were stuck in an environment that would kill them. And friends, here we are as Christians, and, and we live in this world, and it is a dangerous environment spiritually because everything we see, everything we're told is foolish and unwise and left on our own, unchecked, it will kill us spiritually. We need a different environment. We need to be able to breathe gospel air. And thankfully, it's available for us. Because James goes on to describe another kind of wisdom, godly wisdom. And James offers us three life-giving characteristics of godly wisdom that we need to receive and apply in our lives. And so the first characteristic of godly wisdom is that it is heavenly. Look at what James says in the first part of verse 17. But the wisdom from above. So godly wisdom, the, the kind of wisdom that is life-giving and so necessary for everyday people like us, it is, it is heavenly wisdom. It comes from God. It originates with Him. And so friends, that means that when you have a really tough decision to make in life and you really need wisdom for a situation, it is imperative that you start with God. The personality test might be important. Where you are in the Enneagram, that, that might be insightful for you. and your, your disc profile might be good to know. Are you an otter or a lion or a golden retriever? That's not where we're going to start. We're not going to give those nearly the same weight that we give guidance from God. Uh, we're for sure not going to be checking our horoscope to gain insight and wisdom. We're going to leave that kind of astrology stuff back with the satanic wisdom that we've rejected. And sure, there might be some, some self-help books out there that are beneficial and good. We're not going to start with them. Going to a therapist can be really wise and useful, but is your therapist telling you things that would contradict God's wisdom? Wisdom has to start with God. Remember what James told us back in, in chapter 1. He said that if we lack wisdom, all we have to do is ask God, and God will give us that wisdom generously or, or liberally. God gives wisdom to people who ask for it, like a Five Guys employee gives out French fries. You ever go to, to Five Guys? Now, you, it's gotten to the point where you have to take out a small loan to take your family there. Stupid expensive. But have you ever gotten fries? Oh my goodness. They fill that bag up, and then they take one big, more giant scoop and put it in the bag, and it's just overflowing. That's what James says God will do for you when you need wisdom, and you ask him for it. I mean, if God is the one that created this world and he created us, then it would make sense that we would tap into the wisdom that the creator makes available to us. And how does God make his wisdom available? Well, first of all, he gives us his word. Right? We really do believe that God wrote a book. And in that book, you have everything you need to make decisions that will put you on a successful path in life. God's also given us his spirit. As we read the Bible, God's Spirit leads us and guides us and directs us. And God has given us each other. He's given us a Christian community where other people who have maybe been through what you're going through can, can lovingly and humbly speak into your life. When you need wisdom, it is imperative that you start with God. I read this article a few weeks back that back in 1985, 
Queen Elizabeth, she was the one they called the Queen Mother, so she was the mother of the queen that just died several months ago. She took a trip to Sydney, Australia, and uh, she'd made this trip many times before. But this time, while she was there, she wrote a letter to the citizens of Sydney, and she made one request that that letter would not be opened and read until 2085, 100 years after she wrote the letter. Nobody to this day has any idea what the letter says. Right? She sealed it up, um, and, and, and she didn't let anybody read it. She's dead now, so we can't ask her. I mean, the queen wrote a letter, and it is just a big mystery. Friends, our king wrote a letter. He wrote a book to us, and its contents are not a mystery. We can read it anytime we want. We can study it. We can apply it. We can live it out, and we can be confident that it will lead us down the right path. Godly wisdom is heavenly. It originates with God. Second of all, James says that godly wisdom is humble. He continues here in verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. He's giving us a list of all of these attributes of heavenly wisdom, and if he could sum them all up into, into one idea, it's a picture of humility. And it would make sense that godly wisdom from heaven is humble because Jesus was humble and gentle. The greatest person that ever lived, the person who had every reason to brag on himself and to puff himself up and to bring attention to himself, was the most humble person to ever live. And I don't think that there is another characteristic or attribute that is more attractive than somebody who's humble. Are you humble? If I ask your family members, your your spouse, your kids, your coworkers, would they describe you as somebody that is humble? Because if humility is the most attractive characteristic a person can have, somebody who is arrogant and prideful is the most repulsive characteristic. And friend, if you are humble, if there is arrogance and pride in your life, could you really be described as wise? What are some subtle ways that that, that we might demonstrate the sin of pride and in doing so, demonstrate that we aren't wise but foolish? How about this? How about fault finding? Are are you somebody that just always has to find fault in others and you nitpick and you always look at this and you're critical about that? Or maybe you have a harsh spirit. You're always irritated. You're always frustrated. you're, You're very judgmental. Maybe, you, maybe you're very defensive. You, you can't ever receive feedback or criticism. Maybe for you it plays out in that you are attention-seeking. You always like to draw attention to yourself, and maybe you don't do that in real life, but maybe for you it plays itself out on social media. You talk about yourself a lot. You're always turning the conversation to you, and you never ask questions. You never are curious about others. Maybe you disregard the advice of others. Maybe you won't submit to authority. I mean, if those evidences that that, that you have bought into the satanic, selfish, soiled wisdom of the world, if those are true about you, the Bible would say that you have a ways to go when it comes to wisdom. See, pride is rightfully taking the credit that belongs to God, and it's claiming it as your own. There's a a funny story about uh, Joe DiMaggio, the famous New York uh, Yankee center fielder. Joe had taken a few years off from baseball to go fight in World War II, and when he returned, his first game back at Yankee Stadium was packed. Everybody wanted to see Joe DiMaggio. So right before the the game started, the manager told Joe, he said, hey, I think you should go out into the field. I think it would be good for you to just acknowledge people, tip your hat to people, thank them for, for their support. And so he did. Right before the first pitch, Joe DiMaggio walked out onto the field, and he grabbed his five-year-old son, Joe DiMaggio Jr., and the two of them walked out of the field together. And as they were walking out, everybody was chanting, Joe, Joe, Joe. And Joe's little boy said, Daddy, everybody's calling my name. (laughs) Aw, that's so cute. But it wasn't reality. And our pride is the same thing. It's, It's not reality. It's taking the credit from God and ascribing it to ourselves. And when you do that, friend, it proves that you are not wise. And some of you this morning, if you were honest, you look at your life and you see that you've made some of those foolish decisions, maybe, maybe financial decisions. Maybe you've made some foolish decisions relationally, maybe in your marriage or, or in your parenting or in your work or your career. 
I mean, you need some serious wisdom in those areas. Could you ever be humble enough to find somebody here at church who has had some success in those areas and go up to them and say, hey, could I, could I buy you a cup of coffee? Could I buy you lunch? And could you tell me how I can do better with my money or my marriage? Could you tell me how I can improve in, in my parenting? Friends, that's the kind of humble wisdom that, lo- that God loves to give. And here's the thing. When you pursue wisdom that is heavenly and humble, you're going to find out that it is also harmonious. That's the third characteristic of godly wisdom. It's harmonious, meaning that it works. Look at what James says in verse 18. He says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. The the fruit of this kind of righteous wisdom is peace. Not regret for making foolish decisions, but peace that comes from knowing, I prayed about this. And I sought godly counsel about this. And I searched the scriptures about this. And God has given me a peace about it. I mean, if worldly wisdom is soiled and doesn't work, godly wisdom does work. You know, I could go over that of that piano, and I could sit down, and I could start plunking away on the keys, and it would sound awful. I mean, you would scrunch your face up, because I don't have a clue how to play the piano. But if Jeff Kenauer or Jeannie Jocelyn or, or Knowlton sat down and played, it would sound beautifully harmonious. I, I don't have a clue how to press those keys in a way to make it sound beautiful, but they do. It works for them. That's what godly wisdom does for you. And check this out. I love this. When Christians like us make it our goal to pursue godly wisdom, do you know what it leads to? It leads to evangelistic effectiveness. That's a fancy way of saying it is possible that non-Christians will see how you live your life and, and they might just place their faith and trust in Jesus because of watching your life. That's what that phrase, fruit of righteousness, means. When Christians tap into the wisdom of God and they live out the wisdom of God, man, it could be a really powerful thing for the world around us to see. Now, some of you might be sitting here and you don't know Jesus. You you know about Jesus. You, You might have information about Jesus, but you don't really know Jesus in a saving way. And as you look at your life, if you were honest with yourself, maybe you'd have to say, man, I have made a mess of things. I have not made very many wise decisions in my life, and my life is is kind of a mess because of it. I don't even know how to start to make things right with God. Well, this is the good news of what we call the gospel, that God will take you right now just as you are. With all of your poor decisions, with all of the foolish choices you've made, with all of your sin, that's how all of us came to God. God will take you as is. So two weeks ago, of course, the the Super Bowl was on. San Francisco 49ers played the team that Taylor Swift's boyfriend plays for. Did you watch the halftime show? Wasn't my favorite. Uh, You know, I thought Usher did an okay job. He's a talented singer and dancer. But uh, halfway through the halftime show, Alicia Keys came out and played and sang a, a song on the piano. And if you watched it live, you may have noticed that like the first thing out of her mouth, her voice cracked. She hit a sour note. <clears throat> well, she went on to do a great job. She's, a, <clears throat> she's super talented. But what's interesting is that the NFL immediately scrubbed out that sour note that, that she hit. They auto-tuned it or whatever. So any rebroadcast of the halftime show won't show that little vocal flaw. If you uh, look up the halftime show on YouTube on the NFL's official page, you won't find it anywhere. They cleaned it up. Because you've got to be perfect. Right? Can't ever mess up. Can't ever make any mistakes. And friends, that's just a reminder that that's how the world might be, but that is not how God is. You do not have to clean up your act to come to God. You don't have to get everything in your life in order before coming to Jesus. He will take you right now as is sour notes and all. So the question for us is, would you come to Jesus this morning as you are? Would you come to Jesus with all of your sin and all of your foolish decisions that you've made? And in repentance, would you say, Jesus, I admit, I have made a mess of things. But I believe that you died to make things right. Please forgive me and make me new. And the promise of God is that when you do that, God will invade your life with grace and mercy and wisdom. And every single one of us this morning desperately need wisdom to make it through life. 
And so you have a choice this morning. You have two paths in life that you, can, that you can take, that you can choose from. The world's way or God's way. How many of you, when you were younger, when you were a kid, ever read these books? Encyclopedia Brown. You ever read these books? I want to see like some hands here. Am I the only one? All right. Yeah, Encyclopedia Brown, he was like a, a kid detective. So he was always solving problems and mysteries and figuring out cases. And the thing that I love the most about these books is that they are what we call a choose-your-own-adventure book. So you, you'd get to the end of, of chapter 2, and you'd be presented with a choice. If you think Encyclopedia Brown should go snoop around for clues at the old abandoned mill, uh, turn to page 87. If you think Encyclopedia Brown should just go hang out with his friends, turn to the next page. Well, I would always choose the more dangerous, adventurous option. And sometimes that, that was the right choice, but sometimes it wasn't. And sometimes it was a dead end or it would, it would put Encyclopedia Brown in some kind of danger. Now that's totally harmless to do when you're reading a kid's book. But that is not a great way to live your life. Friends, we have the choice to live the world's way or to live God's way. The world offers us its own set of solutions that, that oftentimes sound really good, but ultimately leads to dead ends and confusion. And God's way, though it always doesn't seem obvious or glamorous, it leads to true wisdom and fulfillment. So friends, as, as you navigate the chapters of your life, remember that in a lot of ways, you hold the pen to your own story. Are you going to choose the, the fleeting promises of the world, or are you going to trust in the timeless wisdom of God? Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, we come to you now, and Lord, we admit that we are people that uh, left uh, on our own to our own devices uh, would be very, very unwise. And God, we admit that we would be people that would make decisions that are, that are foolish, decisions that would hurt us and hurt others around us. And God, that's why we're so grateful and thankful for your word, for passages like this that offer us just practical, everyday wisdom. Lord, for those of us that know Jesus this morning, we are so grateful and thankful for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we're thankful for your word. We, we have everything we need, Lord, to make decisions that are wise, decisions that will not lead us to, to regret, decisions that will, that will honor you. And so I pray for us, Lord. God, we are presented every day, in big ways and small ways, with choices to make. And I pray, Father, this week that we would make choices that would lead us to life. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.